Okay, sorry for the delay. Um, so we're going to start a new unit today, which is uh, on convolutional and deep networks. And today's lecture won't involve very much math. So good, just before spring break. Not have too much math. Um, <clears throat> so it's sort of uh, big picture issues, a bit of history. So, um, so in just in terms of uh, perspective, um, when you look at what was happening before about 2009, um, when people worked on image recognition, basically like classifying what's in images, they worked on small data sets, relatively small by today's standards. So for example, MNIST, which we've talked about, 70,000 examples, 10 classes, 28 by 28 images. Another very famous one is CIFR-10, 60,000 examples, 10 classes, 32 by 32 images. And there's another one, Pascal VOC, that is um, not so popular now, but probably was back then. So 11,000 examples, 20 classes, and so on. And these are um, examples of CIFR-10. Uh, these are the 10 classes that they have, and these are just uh, examples of you know, 10 images from each class. You can see they're pretty small. And when you think about um, what was happening in those days, you know, this is before we had, um, this is before the deep network revolution. So we didn't have GPUs to train anything. We, um, so we had CPUs, obviously, 15 years ago, they were a lot slower than today's, um, and so on. And so basically, <clears throat> at the time, 2009, it was sort of a crazy idea to imagine trying to collect a much, much larger data set that was flying against reason at the time. People already were struggling with the data sets they had. But that was, uh, it turns out, a kind of a brilliant and key idea um, to making the deep network revolution possible. And so <clears throat> this all happened with the ImageNet uh, database, which is probably the most famous image database now of all time. And, and so again, the, 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 the motivation behind the idea was um, to develop better algorithms or methods, we need to collect more data. So again, that was not um, the way everyone was thinking, so it, was, it seemed kind of crazy at the time. Um, but that was the, the objective. And so uh, the idea or the details were, you could say, the goal is to map out the entire world of objects. It sounds crazy, right? Um, but so what they ended up doing is collecting 3.2 million images. And these are um, yeah, 3.2 million images of uh, 5,200 different classes. They're organized hierarchically based on something called WordNet. WordNet is a word database where all words are categorized hierarchically. And so they use that idea. <clears throat> and um, now the next question is, OK, how do you label these images? Because when you see images on the internet, there's, they're not labeled. They're just an image. So what's in them? How do you know? So they used a service called Amazon's Mechanical Turk. It still exists. Um, if you want to farm out really simple tasks to many people, um, you can do this. You pay maybe, uh, I don't know. It depends what you're doing, maybe a cent or something for someone to label an image. And so that's how they got these images all labeled this way. And you can read all the details in this 2009 paper. But here are just a few examples. So um, <clears throat> here, um, so, so for, for dogs, there was a very specific thing they did where they made a very like detailed and deep hierarchy. hierarchy. So you have like mammals, within mammals, there's placental mammals. Within those, carnivores are one type, canines are one type, dogs are one type, working dogs are one type of that, huskies, and so on. Um, another example, vehicles, crafts, which include spacecraft, aircraft, things like that. Then watercrafts, sailing vessels, sailboats, trimorans. So you can see the kind of level of detail that they have in this data set. Um, and <clears throat> once the data set was, uh, was there, they could hold a competition 
um, where they could get people to compete on this data set and really develop great new methods. And that was this ImageNet Large Scale Visual Recognition Challenge, ILSVRC. So this was a data, data challenge that was uh, held yearly from 2010 to 2017. <clears throat> and this was a, you know, spe especially in those days, it was a very difficult challenge. So every year there was different specific competitions. So in 2012, there was three, at least three, classification. And so for this task, they used 1,000 classes. And for a given test image, you, uh, you were supposed to list the five more likely class, most likely classes per image. And you were said to get a correct classification if the true one was one of the five you listed. Um, then they had another competition on fine-grained classification where they had, for dogs, they had 120 different categories of dog. And so that was like, you know, can you really um, tell, you know, specific dog breeds, which is, which is pretty tough. <clears throat> and then they had another competition, which is classification with localization. So not only do you want to um, list what you think the image is about, but also draw a bounding box on that image showing where in the image you find that distinguishing feature. Um, <clears throat> and so here are just examples of images to show you how difficult this can be because each image can actually contain multiple objects. Um, those objects could have different scales, big, small. They could be rotated. There could be weird lighting. They could be occluded. Maybe you don't see everything. And so just as one challenging example, look at this image. So, you know, if you would ask me what's in there, I would say that's, that's a dog, uh, Dalmatian. But actually this is correctly labeled as cherry because there are some cherries down here. Um, or here's another one that I think is really difficult, motor scooter. Just because the way the lighting is, the scooter is actually quite dark. And so, you know, what instead maybe I would be drawn to is I would see these people, I would see cars, I would see signs, and so on. And, and the scooter is actually, yeah, it's there, but you have to look for it. Um, and so on. So, um, so this is a challenging task, but... Um, <clears throat> This is how you, how you make advances as you set up competitions and you let people fight each other and then that's where things really start to, to happen. So um, here's uh, accuracy on, on uh, at least one of these contests as you go through the years, 2010, 11, 12, and so on. And so you can see like before 2012, um, which is when deep networks came into the picture. You had accuracy maxing out here, you know, in the 70s, 70%. Then in 2012, uh, that's when the first deep net was used. And so the deep nets here are in green. And you can see there's a huge jump in performance, the deep networks above the others. It's a, you know, they beat everyone else by like 10%. Um, and so they, they defined a new state of the art. And then what you see after this point, future years, um, people just gave up on the traditional networks and everyone focused on deep networks. And yes, performance kept getting better and better and better until it's in the high 90s, 2015. So this is sort of um, what happened with um, with image processing and, and deep learning, this was 2012 was really the kind of breakthrough. A similar thing happened at the same time with speech processing. So there was a similar breakthrough there where all of a sudden deep networks were beating all the other um, previously state-of-the-art approaches. And then after that point, um, you saw this in many, many other fields where deep networks were beating the state-of-the-art and state-of-the-art was being replaced. Um, so this very first network, this was uh, AlexNet by um, Jeff Hinton at University of Toronto. And so he's a person that's been working on neural networks for a long time, um, you know, into the 90s, maybe even the 80s. Um, and he was one of those people that stuck with it. And in the 2000s, 
nobody's working on this stuff because uh, it sort of hit a wall and it, it just didn't seem productive anymore, so everyone else quit. But he was one of the people that just kept going, kept hammering away at it. And so he was you know, largely responsible for the renewed attention and the rebirth of deep networks that we see begin here. <clears throat> So um, we'll talk a lot more about AlexNet in, after the break, but here's just um, a little bit about it. So the main idea that, that their group set out to do at the time was to build a very deep network. And at the time, a very deep network is this eight-layer network um, that was incredibly deep. And <clears throat> so the picture here, we, we have to put ourselves in the computer science mindset and realize that these big blocks are not uh, the system parts of the block diagram, they're actually the data. So each of these blue things shows you a representation of the data at the different stages in the deep network, and the red is actually showing you a representation of the processing. Um, it's a particular kind of processing, which are these convolutional layers, which we'll talk about um, maybe today or maybe after the break. And, and so when you start out, here, you're starting with an image that is of size 224 by 224 pixels, but it has, it's a color image, so it has red, green, blue channels. So you have three channels, and so you have uh, what we call a tensor, which is sort of like a multi-dimensional, it's a, it's a matrix, but with more than two dimensions. So this is what you start with, and then you go through, and the shape of the data changes in each layer, as we'll talk about, but finally, you get out just a thousand by one vector, and we need that because we're going to do 1,000 class softmax because we're trying to classify which out of 1,000 classes. So to do this, they had to introduce a bunch of tricks that now are standard, but at the time they were new. Things like the ReLU, which we, we talked about that kind of activation function that um, looks like this. <clears throat> Some other tricks, max pooling and dropout and so on, which we'll get into. Um, but when you look at the size of the network, 60 million parameters, pretty huge, right? Especially compared to stuff we've been talking about. And this is not big by today's standards, but at the time, it was incredibly big, um, 650,000 neurons, and, um, <clears throat> or you could say, you could call them feature maps. So this was uh, you know, quite a feat to train this thing, because this is before GPUs, this is um, before TensorFlow and all that. So, you know, a lot of custom code, a lot of attention to how you actually get all this stuff done with backpropagation and so on. So it was, it was quite remarkable. Uh, but it was, yeah, it was transformational too. Any questions on anything so far? Okay. So, um, okay, so how, how do these work? So let's, let's think back to our two-layer neural network um, where we have an initial layer that um, takes in our, our signal X, computes uh, some linear scores by applying inner product with a weight vector, adding a bias, and then this linear score goes through our hidden layer activation function, which might be a sigmoid or something like that, to give our activation um, A. So we're just focusing on a single activation here um, just for ease of interpretability. And <clears throat> let's kind of think about what happens. So um, when we go through this, this first layer and you get this score, we know that we can think about this in terms of linear classification where there's essentially two half spaces. This, so this... This is the feature space, or yeah, the original feature space, like x1 and x2 if x is two-dimensional. <clears throat> and so we have this uh, hyperplane boundary, which we know is orthogonal to w. So w is pointing in this direction, which is orthogonal to our boundary. And we know that the bias is responsible for for shifting this somewhere. <clears throat> but overall, what this does for us 
and, and remember that this is, this is our, uh, our sigmoid. So when we finally compute this z, z is essentially measuring how far we are in this direction, in the parallel to w direction from that boundary. So as you go, you know, on the boundary, z is 0. So you go one way, z goes positive. On the other way, z goes negative. And then you put it through this, and it, it turns that um, real number into what we call a soft output between 0 and 1. So by doing this, we're essentially um, splitting our space of x in half into these two half spaces, where on one side we, we get um, activations close to 1, on the other side, activations close to zero, and right on the boundary, activations would be 0.5. Um, but essentially what we're doing is we're learning to separate the features in X into you know, two regions on either side of here. And so this is really what's happening at every layer in this deep network, and it kind of explains or helps us understand um, the role that w, w plays. So in particular, let's, let's think about the size of A. Um, let's think about which X will make A large. OK, so if you think about, so this is A. A is this. So A is large when Z is large, right? A is close to 1 when, as Z goes much greater than 0. So A is largest when Z is largest. Now, how do we make Z large? So to make Z large, um, essentially what we want is we want that W is collinear with X. So one way to understand why that is is we can write an upper bound using the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality, which says that this thing, W transpose X, is upper bounded by the norm of W times the norm of X. That's the largest that this can be, which essentially tells us, you know, for a fixed B, what's the largest that Z can be. And the way to attain this maximum value is to set X and W to be collinear. So that means X has to be C times W for any, um, for any scalar C. Okay, so or any, any positive scalar C. Um, <clears throat> so that says, like, if you're, if you're wondering which X will make the activation largest, we should look for X that are W times some positive scalar. And you essentially can think of that as a sort of pattern matching. This, this inner product uh, is just like you're multiplying, you know, the, the first times the first, plus the second times the second, and so on, and summing them up. And to make that maximum, you want x and w to be aligned to each other, tuned to each other. x should just be, it should look just like w, but maybe it's scaled differently. So that's essentially how you make a given activation come alive, how you make it large. Um, and of course, if, if these guys are orthogonal, if x is orthogonal to w, then this goes to 0. And, um, and if you want to make A small, you actually set X collinear to W, but with a negative C. And then it's, it's as small as can be. There's the other side of the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality. Okay, so this is just sort of just trying to explain a little bit about um, what's happening when we go through a linear layer followed by one of these nonlinearities. And so that's, that's what happens at these um, intermediate layers. And then in a two-layer network, um, we can implement nonlinear boundaries if we take those linear boundaries that are in the hidden layers, and then we do some more, um, we do another linear combination followed by another um, sigmoid. <clears throat> and when we do this, we're essentially using intersections of those half spaces that we had established using the hidden layers. Okay. 
So those are the half spaces, and then we can intersect them to finally get something like this. We saw, we kind of went through that in the last unit and saw that. <clears throat> and this is a nice tool, um, TensorBoard, or in, in PyTorch, it's called TensorBoard X. And it's actually set up to do all that sort of visualization that we saw back in unit eight. So here, this is showing that the input just has you know, it's two numbers. This is showing the output versus the first and second. So this is essentially the same kind of um, thing we saw in unit eight. And here, these little things show um, those, those linear boundaries in the feature space. So again, x1, x2. So it helps you visualize, OK, these are the different half spaces. And then this is some intersection between them that finally gives us this. So when we have two layers, we can make some nonlinear boundaries, but we're a little bit limited in terms of what we can make. Um, we can, yeah, we have these intersections of half spaces, so we can create regions like this, but we can't really do all that much more than that. So two layer networks are useful up to a point, but then you know, they're not very useful after that. So the question is, well, what if we have a more complicated decision region like this one? So here's the scatter plot showing the orange and blue samples. And so we want to have a classification boundaries that are you know, kind of um, complicated, something like this. And <clears throat> we're not going to be able to do that <clears throat> with a two-layer network. But we can do that with more layers, using the same idea but more layers. And this is kind of motivating why we're going from two layers to more than two. Why, why do we want depth? So, <clears throat> so here is an example using that same TensorBoard tool. We've made a four-layer network um, with looks like eight hidden layers in the first two stages and then um, five in the third. And we can see here how, if we just look at these pictures, so here we can see how the, um, oops, sorry. These are the half spaces that we're using as building blocks. And then using different linear combinations of those, you can see that we're creating some more complicated shapes in the second layer. You know, this is like a certain intersection of half spaces, another one, another one like this, and so on. Still pretty simple shapes. But then we do one more stage where we actually combine these. And now we're starting to get more interesting shapes, um, and so on. And then we can combine these, finally, to get something like this, which is doing a pretty good job of classifying our training data. And so we can see the power of stacking multiple uh, linear and simple sigmoid layers together and actually accomplishing um, a pretty challenging goal. Okay. Any questions on anything here? Yeah. Uh, can you go back up? Sure. So this looks very similar to uh, what we can accomplish with SVMs, be it like the as you pointed out, like drawing the four lines kind of creates this shape. When would we want to use uh, neural nets versus SVMs? So SVMs, it's really hard to visualize what's going on there. They can do a lot more than this. They, yeah, they can do this, but they can also do a lot more. So I don't want you to think the SVMs can only do this. Um, it's just hard to visualize what's happening with kernels. And we didn't really try to get into it too much. Um, but yeah, with, with two layers, there's, um, you know, there's structurally um, not as much you can do. You can, I mean, you can do more as you add more and more channels, but it's often more efficient rather than adding, like, tons and tons of, by channels I mean these, rather than adding, like, hundreds or thousands of these, just go another layer, and then you can, you get sort of a hierarchical thing where you can, use combinations of the things from the first layer to build structures in the second layer, which are quite sophisticated. 
So I don't know if that answers the question. Yeah. Um, yeah, so this is just, these are all just examples, you know, simple examples of things you can do. But you can see that as you go uh, and add more layers, you can do more sophisticated stuff by each of these builds on combinations of these, each of these builds on combinations of these, and then this builds on combinations of these. <coughs> so. All right, any other questions on this? Okay. So, um, <coughs> so, but then it remains the question, like these are just toy examples. How do you, how do you do like real world problems like, you know, classifying complex images? Um, <coughs> So essentially, it's, it's sort of the same idea, but just with a lot more depth and a lot more uh, horsepower at each, at each layer. But the idea is, is very similar. We want to build these complex hierarchies. And so what we do at, at early layers is we build relatively simple detectors, or detectors that can detect relatively simple shapes. So we'll talk more about these convolutional kernels in a bit, but these are, in some sense, these are like little edge detectors. This guy is going to detect an edge with that angle. This is going to detect an edge with that angle, and so on. And and that's what you learn to do, or the network learns to do with the early layers. And then the later layers end up essentially coming up with more sophisticated combinations of these that are relevant for the classification task for which it was trained. <coughs> And so you start to get more interesting shapes. And then later layers use combinations of these to get, again, more interesting shapes, where you start to see here things like eyes and, and noses and so on. And then later layers can take combinations of these and put those together, you know, in this case, to get faces. But the idea is you start with simple things, and you combine them, and you gradually build more and more complex things. So um, in some sense, that's what all these different networks are doing. Um, yeah. <clears throat> yes? What is one layer on each of these images? Are the A of each layer the... You know, it, I, would, I would have to go to the original source to see exactly what these are. Um, there's there's different ways so so it is it is often hard to really understand what's happening inside one of these big deep networks um, and there's a whole field of study that tries to figure that out so they they'll use different techniques of computing gradients at intermediate layers to try to see like okay if this network thinks it's a dog why did it think it's a dog like can can you go back into the network and, and actually extract like a picture or somehow figure out you know, which pixels on the original image were contributing to it being a dog. Um, it, yeah, it's, it's not easy to do that and, and it's like an ongoing thing. So in some sense, I don't, I don't know exactly how they came up with these pictures. This, this is not showing the activations. No, it's not showing that. Um, the activations, they look just a lot less organized and there's there's like you know millions of them or hundreds of thousands of them, so it's even hard to know where to look. Um, but at the early layers of the network, like the first layer, I will show you some pictures that look like this, which are showing actually, and we haven't talked about it yet, but these are the convolutional kernels. These are in some sense some spatial filters, and, and they often do look just like this. So I, I'm pretty sure that's what these are. I don't know exactly how they created um, these later images. But the overall idea is that you're, you're using these simple shapes and combining them in creative ways to get more and more complicated things so that finally this network can do amazing things like tell you exactly which breed of dog this is. <clears throat> yeah. you know, I, I ask that just because like, thinking back at the Unit 7, when we had the Ws actually representing yeah. The number, um, it, could, like, it was very visual. Exactly, because that's a linear classifier. So linear classifiers, uh, that is exactly the, all the intuition here. Is if for a linear classifier, which is essentially something like this and only this, 
if you want to know how to make this output big, you simply find the pattern that matches the signal. It's like, and then you can visualize it, and it should, yeah, a zero should look like a zero and so on. Um, and that's what's happening in the first layer. But then the question is what happens in later layers. It's not, it's not so easy. Um, but yeah, late, towards the end, you, you'll actually see some of the activations that are taken from inside a network uh, that was trained to, I think it was, I think it's one, it's one of the demos and it was trained to like classify different types of elephants. And you'll see that, yeah, things start out looking like images and then as you go through the network and you go deeper and you, you pull out things from in the middle, they, they don't even look like images anymore. And when you get to the end, let's come back to the AlexNet picture. When you come back, when you go to the very end, these are absolutely not images. These are just, it's a list of a thousand numbers that is all about the class. And this is an image. And in the middle, the information is kind of halfway between images and classes. And it just gradually transforms. Um, and yeah, so. So it's, it's interesting to, to peek inside, but it's challenging to really understand what's, what's going on. And that's one of the issues with these networks is they're so powerful, but not very well understood. <coughs> All right. Good. Any, any more questions? Okay. So, um, so this, this idea of the multi-stage processing getting more and more sophisticated is actually what happens inside um, brains, like in this... I don't know if this is a human brain or what brain this is. I think maybe it is a human brain, but it's probably the same for all mammalian brains. So uh, neuroscience scientists have basically um, categorized different areas in the brain based on how early they process the visual input. So there's this V1 region, which is pretty much directly connected to the, the optic nerves. And... Um, and then the information you know, from our eyes travels there first. It gets processed there. And then from there, it moves to the V2 region, which does higher level processing, and then V4, and eventually you know, more sophisticated processing. And so actually, you know, what happens in our brains is, is very similar to these deep networks in spirit. And what's even more interesting is that they've done experiments with the V1 layer and they've looked at the outputs of individual neurons there, and they've watched to see how do I create a visual stimuli that makes particular neurons, you know, excite, come alive. And they find that it's exactly these sorts of um, weird little images that are the same ones that these neural networks in the first layer learn. That's essentially the way our V1 stage is also working. It has learned to, to look for the same simple pictures. And then later stages put those together and combine them in interesting ways. <clears throat> so that's pretty cool. Okay. All right, so a little bit of history then. <clears throat> so the very first deep network was uh, in the 60s. And the very first convolutional deep network was in 1980. And the first time people applied backpropagation to these deep networks was also in the 80s. And you can imagine all the challenges that you had in those days. Number one, uh, there wasn't much training data out there. Uh, we were not as connected. We just, the, you know, we just didn't collect as much data. Obviously, computational power was way more limited. And then the techniques that they were using at the time also um, had some issues that they hadn't figured out yet. So one important one is what we call the vanishing gradient problem. And the idea is like this. Um, when you look at a sigmoid or tan H, um, which are just basically you know, shifts of, a, of something that looks like this. So this is the input Z, the output A. So remember that when we do backpropagation, um, essentially, like when you go from layer to layer, you're multiplying the gradients from the previous layer times some new gradients, right? And then you multiply those times some new gradients and so on. 
And so every time you go through an activation function, you multiply it by the gradient of that activation. And when you look at, you know, being, let's say, when z is close to 0, the gradient is close to 1, which is great. But as soon as z gets either positive or negative, then the gradient is less. And if z is, you know, even a little bit far from the origin, the gradient is almost 0. So that what that means is when you propagate back through a, an activation function, the gradients, the, the, yeah, what you back propagate is only significant when the scores are close to zero. And if the scores are non-zero or you know, farther from zero, you get a very weak signal. And that happens every layer. So as you go from layer to layer to layer, those weak signals get weaker and weaker and weaker and weaker. And as you get to the front end of the network, there's no more gradients. There's nothing to cause those coefficients to change. And that's called the vanishing gradient problem. So this was sort of something that people didn't figure out until I think around the AlexNet time more recently. Um, and so they were using these, because uh, these, these are the, the sort of main um, activations that people use in the shallower networks and that they use historically. They didn't realize that there was an issue with this until they had these deeper networks and they basically found that like the, the deeper networks just didn't train. They, you, know, you would make a network deeper and then it would just stop adapting. So, um, but eventually <clears throat> figured out that there's some solutions to this. For example, the ReLU activation, which we know looks like this, has a gradient of exactly one for any positive input. So there, so you know, there is essentially no vanishing gradient at least when the input is is one or positive. Of course, if the input is negative, you get exactly no gradient at all. Uh, but probably that will not happen with every training sample in the batch. You know, some of them will, but some of them won't be negative, and so you should get some propagation. So the use of, um, <clears throat> of ReLU was sort of a key idea to making networks deeper than just a few layers because it could avoid this vanishing gradient problem. <clears throat> so, so that was, was a major, major step forward. Um, and there's, the ReLU is not perfect, and there's, there's improvements on it, which we'll talk about uh, more later. Um, other things which we'll talk about is the use of convolutional layers versus just uh, what we call dense layers, which are like the layers we saw in the last unit, which is just like a matrix multiply and an, an addition. Um, those matrix multiplies just get too giant. They become overwhelming in terms of memory and computation. Um, and so using convolutional layers was also really key. So, and then there's all these other tricks that were developed more recently, batch norm, dropouts, connections, which we'll get into, get into all those details. All right, so, um, all right, any questions on anything so far? Yeah. It's not significant, but the name Alex now seems very strange given the uh, yeah, I, I actually don't remember. There is a story behind it. Uh, I don't know if anyone knows it, but yeah. I, I can't remember if it was like one of the grad students or if it was even something different than that. But there is, yeah, there's some okay. reason. I don't think it's an acronym. I think it was like just some name they chose. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> okay, so, so we're going to talk about convolution now. Um, and... <clears throat> Again, this is sort of inspired by the fact that um, you can think of um, each, each network as finding some sort of pattern, sorry, each layer finding some sort of pattern as we saw with that Cauchy-Schwartz argument. So, because remember that, um, so we said like, let me, so we said this operation, this is an inner product between two vectors. But in your uh, most recent homework, you also saw that this is an inner product between two matrices. Right? So this is, sorry, it should be an X. And then this thing is, uh, is basically a fancy way of saying you take W, you take X, you do a Hadamard product, and then you just sum up all the entries in that matrix. So that's essentially, if I have like a, 
one image and then some template and I'm looking for the template, I'm essentially, I'm doing, I'm doing this, I'm doing this, I'm doing this. So that's kind of what's happening at every layer. And we're trying to build up these local patterns into more and more complicated patterns. <clears throat> so one of the key ideas is that these, these, these little patterns, let's say we're looking for at the beginning, these guys, we know that these little things can be located anywhere in the image, right? Middle, sides, top, bottom. So we call that translation invariance. Like, th these patterns are not specific to a certain area in the image. They can be anywhere. Um, and so that gives us kind of a clue of, of how to search for them uh, by taking some small template and sliding that around until we find it. So that's, that's the idea here. Um, and this is expressed with something a little bit like in the spirit of MNIST, digit recognition. So the idea is, let's say we have an image that has a whole bunch of digits, and we were looking for the presence of a four. So imagine that we have a template for a prototypical four like this, and we're, we want to know like where, where can I find that in this image? So what I could do is I could take that little image, and I could slide that around, slide it all around until the inner product with that and the underlying image is large. And then I know, oh, I found one, right? So I, so like if I would slide this to where this pink box is, the output would be big. But if I slid this to where this pink box is, the output would be small. So essentially by, and then J1, J2 are just the, they're the indices. This is like, this is like J1 and J2. These are the, the pixel indices in the final image here. So that would be somewhere here. Um, <clears throat> so that's, that's the idea. And when we write it um, with, with pixels and all that, we, we essentially get this, this. So let's try to understand this. <clears throat> okay, so the, so the, the W, the W is our template. This is a small image. And this, in particular, is size capital K1 by capital K2. So that's, or maybe I, I think I should do it the other way. K2 this way, K1 this way. Um, no, maybe, sorry. I should do it the other way. So this is K1, this is K2, this is J1, this is J2. OK. So, so that's what this is. And then this is just the k one row and k two column of that image. And that's going to be a pixel with a certain brightness. So um, you know, usually white is a large value. Black is 0, something like this. But of course, Depends how you format it. OK, and then this x is the underlying image. And j is going to be, this is sort of like the output, the pattern match thing. And this is saying we're going to look at output index j1 and j2 here. And so what I'm doing is I'm basically sliding w so that it is centered around j1 and j2 in the original image. But then I'm going to do a pointwise multiply for each of these K1 and K2s. I'm going to multiply by the pixels at this offset of K1 and K2 in the original image. So we can think of these as maybe offsets from, from J1 and J2, which are the, um, where we are in the output image. And then, and then we're doing this. Um, this inner product, this matrix inner product, we're basically just, yeah, multiplying the weights times the pixels underneath at this shift, at the J1 and J2 shift, and we're seeing, what do we get? Do we get something big or small? <clears throat> okay. Is this equation making sense? Or, yeah. But isn't J, J1, J2 like the corner of the... Yes, it would be, it would be like the, 
top left corner um, because it, it, basically the way we did things here, we started these Ks at zero. Yeah, so so that would be like as we go this way, we go through the Ks. And so yes, this would be sort of like the top left corner reference of where we're looking. Yeah, good point. So then the K1, K2, put it on the center. Yeah, so if we're, if we're looking like right at the output index 0, 0, then this thing would be located right there. So its, it's top left corner would be aligned with the top left corner of the image. Okay, so, so that's sort of the idea. And this is called correlation in the signal processing literature you may have heard. And this is not correlation like statistical correlation. This is a different kind of signal processing type correlation. It's used quite a bit in radar and some other fields. Um, this is how you search for like radar waveforms that, that are coming at you. You essentially do something like this, but um, this would be a time domain variables rather than space domain variables. Okay. Any questions on this equation before I move on? Yeah. So in this case, X is the same size as, as the weights matrix? No. So usually not. So usually this is a really small matrix, K1 by K2. And then X can be as large as you want. So X is typically, you know, because we're going to be moving this around, so this X needs to be much larger. Oh, so I mean when you're indexing it, the equation. Uh, okay. So so the J1 and J2 tell tell you like the where where you are within this. So like maybe I'm down here. That would be my J1 J2 and that means I'm looking at this I, I move my template there and then I Did I not explain it well or uh, do you have a question? Are you iterating over J1 and J2? You well, you well so you're kind of doing an integration you could say over the image. But J1 and J2 kind of tells you the output location in the integral, if you will. It's, it's like, it's just, lo it's telling you where you've moved this before you do that integration. And then that tells you where you are here. And so the value of that um, inner product between the kernel and the underlying image pixels is reported by a single number here. And then this guy is some, some other number down there. Okay, yeah, th this stuff is important to, to understand because it kind of explains what's really going on in these, and it's going to get a little bit more complicated as we, as we go forward. Okay, <clears throat> um, so we're good so far? Okay. All right, so a little bit of terminology then. So as I said, in signal processing, um, we call this operation, which we saw on the previous page, two-dimensional correlation. And if you want to implement this in Python, you go to the scipy.signal library and you find correlate 2D and it does exactly this for you. Um, and this is closely related to something else that I think we talk about more, at least in classes, called convolution. And convolution is identical except for the fact that these pluses are replaced by minuses there. And so essentially what this does functionally is that, so the J is still like the reference point, but rather than when you, when you go down, you know, when you index through your template, rather than moving down to the right, it's kind of like saying you move up and to the left. You sort of, in some sense, reverse and flip and reverse the template. That's essentially what's happening. So, um, so, so it's, it's related, and in fact, if you want to do one with the other, you can do that just by flipping and reversing your template, you know, both directions, and then, and then you will turn correlation into convolution. So it's just, they're, they're very similar. It's just, you know, notationally, they're a little different. Conceptually, very similar. <clears throat> okay, so I had to put in the little Missy Elliott. <laughs> But maybe maybe that's showing my age. I don't know. Okay, so um, so it turns out that when you do um, 
neural networks, you know, for what we want to do, essentially we could do either of these. Either of them would work for us because these are going to be learned weights. So, so if, if I change the signs, I will just end up learning the flipped thing. Um, but it, it's just a little bit simpler, I think, to use the pluses instead of the minuses. So it turns out that all the packages, uh, they implement this, but for whatever reason, they call it convolution. So, so everyone talks about these as convolutional layers, uh, and, but they're not implementing this. They're actually implementing this. They're actually doing this with correlation, but it's called convolution. So just something to keep in mind. Um, so basically, yeah, so this is the idea. Convolution does not include flipping and reversal when you actually implement this in PyTorch or TensorFlow or whatever. So it's a little bit of a misnomer. But in any case, you know, these weights W still call them the kernel. Okay, all right. Uh, so any questions so far? All right. So now <clears throat> we have to think a little bit about how we're going to handle the boundary conditions. And so let's just sort of try to visualize this a little bit. So here, let's focus on the middle one. So this is going to be, the blue is going to be the image. The gray is the kernel, the thing we're moving around, the little pattern. And then this is, or I should say, this is the input image on the blue. And then this is the output. We can also think about it as an image if we want. It's, it, it, you know, it is something that has pixels and amplitudes. Um, but anyway, so you can now see that um, there's this question about how much of a boundary do you use? Um, because if you use no boundary and you have, let's say, a 4x4 four four image and a 3x3 three three kernel, then there's only four different shifts that you can use. And so as a result, the output will only be 2x2. Two two. So somehow, when you've gone through this process, the, if you want to think about this as like the input image and the output image, somehow it's shrunk. Um, the way that we often talk about convolution and correlation in, in other courses like 3050 or 5200 is we tend to assume that um, there's as much zero padding as possible. And what happens in that case is that the size of the image actually tends to increase. And it increases, you know, the larger your kernel, the more it increases. Um, <clears throat> what's probably most typical with neural networks is to do something where you include as much of a, we call this zero padding, as much zero padding as you need based on your kernel size so that the image maintains the same size from image to output, input to output. And it just helps with bookkeeping and the fact that a lot of times, yeah, it, it's just more convenient. But you can do any of these, um, and you can tell the layer um, whatever, whether you're PyTorch or TensorFlow or NumPy, if you want to do convolution, you just have to specify which of these you want it to do, and then it will do it. Okay, so, um, and there's some nice um, animated GIFs of, of how this all looks if you want to click on the links. <clears throat> so, and here's just like a, a very concrete example of a so-called valid mode convolution. Remember, valid mode is the size where there's the, the version where there's no zero padding. So here, what it's showing is it's showing the, in the big numbers are the underlying image. The kernel is represented in the small numbers. And then this is the output image. So to get this pixel of the output image, you're doing 3 times 0 plus 3 times 1 plus 2 times 2 and adding all those up, and you get 12. And then, for example, to get this, you slide that whole template down one. And now you do that inner product between those two, and you'll get a 10, and so on. So just to be really clear about what's going on. Okay. Any questions? Anything here? OK. So, um, <clears throat> so we can demonstrate this in, in Python. Um, and I think we'll do that next time, because I'm, I'm out of town. Um, so it's, yeah, it's a good point to stop. Um, are there any questions on anything I said so far today? OK, great. So this is a good time to stop. So I hope you guys have a good spring break. So obviously no homework will be due next um, 
week, but then the following week, homework um, and lab on unit eight will be due. Um, and so you can, of course, I, it should uh, be posted at 6 p.m. today so you can get started on that whenever. Um, otherwise, yeah, I'll see you guys Monday in a week. Have a good one.